What is dermatologic oncology? What are the differences between melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer? Welcome to the EADV podcast. In today's episode of the EADV podcast, Professor Jan Gutmuth is joined by Professor Pier Giacomo Casavara Pinton, an academic researcher from the University of Brescia, Italy. Together they delve into the topic of dermatologic oncology, including new studies, diagnosis and latest advances in the surgical treatment of malignancies of the skin. But before we get into that, Get ready to experience cutting-edge science and innovation in dermatology and virology at the upcoming EADV Congress in Berlin, Germany, 11th to 14th of October 2023. The EADV Congress is one of the largest and prestigious international gatherings dedicated to dermatology and virology, providing a platform for the brightest minds in research, clinicians, and top industry professionals to come together and share knowledge, make connections, and foster scientific collaboration. The diverse CME-accredited interactive program covering the full AZ of hot topics also includes innovative, hands-on workshops, subspecialty sessions, and industry sessions. The exhibition hall will provide opportunities for attendees to explore the latest technologies, treatments, and products in the field to date. The wait is over. Tickets to attend the Congress in Berlin are on sale now. Be sure to check edvcongress2023.org to learn how to participate and for more information about the event. Join them as they discuss the long-term management of actinic keratoses as well as new diagnostic techniques, the overdiagnosis of melanoma, and finally, its surgical treatment. Enjoy. Good morning. It is a very big pleasure to have uh, Professor Pierre Giacomo Calzavara Pinton with us today. I think we can with no doubt say that he is one of Europe's leader in cutaneous oncology. And um, I look forward, uh, Pierre Giacomo, to discussing with you what is the cutting edge in our field at the moment? Uh, what do we have to think about? Um, I think you have some topics you really care about. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. I'm very happy of this uh, kind of invitation. Now, I wanted to speak about the two uh, problems of diagnosis for uh, uh, cutaneous uh, skin cancer. The first one is uh, we have to change our perspective in the treatment of actinic keratosis. And the second one is uh, the influence of uh, uh, new diagnostic techniques on the uh, incidence of uh, uh, melanoma and other skin tumors that is uh, this uh, incident, this raising incidence that we see in these years is a true incidence or it may depend by an overdiagnosis of uh, early lesions without a true capacity to progress. But come back to the first uh, uh, argument that is uh, the long-term management of actinic keratosis. Now, when you speak about a patient with multiple actinic keratosis, we cannot uh, uh, apply the paradigm of uh, radical of oncologic radicality. Oncologic radicality is the par- paradigm of uh, other tumors of any uh, body organ. That is, if I have to deal with a uh, cancer of the stomach, my goal and my realistic goal must be the eradication of the tumor. But in the case of, of the patient with multiple actinic keratosis, we cannot have the same goal. That is, we have a lot of new therapies, very different, very effective, and this is fantastic. We had a, a, about nothing until 10 years ago, but we continue to calculate the efficacy of this uh, treatments after one single treatment uh, cycle that is uh, uh, you have so you choose the uh, drug on the basis of its ability to a complete clearance but here between bracket there is the first problem that is how to calculate the efficacy some some drug on a 20 square square centimeters other drugs with uh, areas containing uh, a low number of actinic keratosis, that is uh, 6 or 10, and others with uh, 20 or 30. So what it means, if I have treated uh, all three lesions in a field, is 100% uh, percent of uh, complete clearance rate. But if I treat 18 uh, lesions uh, or 
out from 20, it's only 90. But it's crazy because I have treated 18 and if you have a side, I have treated only nine. So, but again, the problem is not that you have to treat, uh, to see the treatment after one treatment goal. You must be in, clear in your mind that you must repeat the treatment several times. So probably the first factor for the efficacy of the treatment is not the efficacy by itself, but is the adherence of the patient to be treated with the same drug several times. And this must be clear when you speak with the patient. Yeah. So can we like explain it almost like in a, in a chronic disease that we tell our patient, we will have a journey together. We will, we will follow up you regularly and, and adjust our treatments according to the evolution. Yes, we, we must be clear with the patient that he has a chronicity. And this is a unique case in uh, uh, dermatological oncology. So it's a chronicity. He must uh, be clear that he, ne he will never clear, he will never heal of his problem. This problem will follow him for the rest of his life, but you have to continue to treat and to, to visit him at follow up. Maybe that these treatments can prevent the development of uh, skin tumors. We do not know, but we know that we can treat his actinic keratosis and, if, uh, and that he is a patient at risk of a, a skin tumor. So if you visit him regularly, we can see these tumors, melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancer at an early phase. So this is the most important uh, point. And for this, we must be sure to have his adherence to our protocol and program. I think that's a really important point. I see a lot of patients who are unhappy. They have been treated by a different colleague once or twice, and they still have a problem. And now they want to come for a final cure. And uh, uh, that we really make clear that it's a chronic disease. And at what intervals do you tend to see your patients? Um, um, does it depend on the number of lesions or do you have some some guidelines we can apply here? No, it's it's crazy, but we have not a guideline on this. But I believe that it depends by your uh, medical sensibility. That is, uh, if a patient, for example, is uh, uh, has had previous skin cancer, okay, he must be followed up at four or six months interval and with everything. If a patient is immunosuppressed, he must be seen every three, four months, because otherwise the situation can be uh, too advanced to rescue the treatment. The, the, the true goal is that we, have, uh, we should not have anybody with a disease progressing to the need of uh, uh, chemiplimab or uh, sonidegib or uh, our PDA1 and so on, because it's crazy, because they, the patient have a bad disease on their face. With uh, we are uh, discussing of uh, leisure with patients with actinic keratosis, so that it's crazy that uh, you cannot see them at an early phase. And do the new diagnostic techniques play a role in this here in early detection? Do you build this into the pathway or? Um, are we still waiting here? Oh, it's a very amazing and fantastic period. Uh, at this moment, uh, also confocal is old. That is, uh, we have uh, uh, confocal is in our daily routine, and uh, the new uh, devices for uh, uh, epiluminescence are fantastic, and uh, the possibility, the new possibility to read the lesions with uh, artificial intelligence. It's a field that we should explore in a, in a short time. And we have also a new device that can read the, all the body at the same moment in a single session. So he, you can have a picture, a 3D picture of all the, uh, the body surface of the patient and, they, and the, the, the device can read each lesion in a short time and can give you, okay, look at this lesion or the other. And why we do not discuss about uh, uh, line field confocal? 
it's it's very interesting for for something and we see that any of these new device has its own uh, place in our daily routine probably the new tech the new advancement will be in optics and will be in artificial intelligence these are very very important but on the other side the use of these new techniques have uh, allowed us to see lesions in a very early phase so we see like it happens for melanoma for melanoma in the past 20 years we had a steep increase of incidence but are we sure that uh, these uh, very early lesions could uh, progress to an invasive cancer we do not know it's it's crazy that we have uh, this a uh, uh, the same mortality and a so steep increase of incidence of early lesions of early lesions uh, look at uh, for example at a patient with uh, lentiago malignia we are looking for a, a, high, a higher and higher number of patients with lentiago malignia because confocal allows you to see uh, or also epiluminescence but are we sure that the vet lentigo malignant could really influence uh, the life uh, uh, expectancy of the of the patient probably he would die of some other uh, disease and not for for this that really brings these interesting questions how do we find the needle in the haystack with all these early lesions is it actinic keratosis or is it in melanoma um do you see some light in the future that very soon we will be able to do, for instance, genetic testing on a skin sample to say this is a high risk uh, tumor, uh, this we need to take out, this is a low risk tumor, we will just follow it up? Or are, we, uh, are the new technologies that you just mentioned already able to give us here some uh, discrimination? Uh, it would, would be fantastic, really fantastic. The only, the only, uh, genetic aspect that we know now we are able to recognize now is the skin color okay if you uh, if you are if you have a light skin you are at risk of melanoma but we do not know anything else in the genotype and phenotype can, that can help us in uh, decide if this patient must be followed up or not because and now it's uh, the, this raising uh, al alarm about uh, uh, skin tumors is uh, causing uh, a problem because uh, the number of dermatologists is a fixed number. The uh, uh, number of potential patients in Europe that, that, that is, is much growing because uh, it's, uh, uh, the population uh, is becoming elderly. And uh, so we must have something to choose the patient to look for, to investigate, to live in a follow-up. Uh, and probably, you are true, uh, genetics could, could be the key to, uh, to select the right patients for a patient's journey that is uh, uh, enough for his state so there's still the good news for our young colleagues is that there's still a lot of interesting work to do um, i think you are raising a, a point of concern um, not only in europe but a worldwide problem we see this steep increase in uh, skin cancer patients we are getting older so we will anyhow develop more skin cancer but our number is fixed or even uh, the working hours are even declining but we need to see more patients and um do you see uh, is there in italy also a way of including teledermatology does this uh, or um like uh, screening apps that can already help here to distinguish um and and to make a pathway to detect patients faster or are we here also still at the very infancy uh teledermatology now is uh, an edge job that is we have many spines uh, and it's uh, a it, it's a very big problem because it may be helpful 
Now, for uh, the follow-up of patients with chronicity, for example, for elderly people with psoriasis and so on. But uh, in my opinion, we have not uh, a true uh, sensi sensibility and sensitivity of uh, uh, a diagnosis of a skin tumor with uh, an app. That is, the app is not able by itself uh, to read something because uh, you have a very high number of false uh, positives and uh, somebody else that is now we know if you uh, ask to a machine but a very good machine not a, an, a, an economic app but uh, 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 if you show to the machine 100 nevi with two melanomas and sh she can uh, in she can understood by itself what is the melanoma with high sensitivity and specificity but uh, if you show to the machine another set of uh, images containing, for example, uh, poroma, uh, uh, pigmented basal cell, and so on, often the machine has not the capacity to learn the difference between uh, lesions of different origin. But we are sure that it will be able to do this. But at the end, it can give you, okay, this lesion has a probability of 98% to be a melanoma. But at the end, the decision will be yours. Because at now, for example, it cannot know if that lesion, for example, an irregular uh, nevi can be read in, in a different way if a patient has 80 years or he has eight years. Or if a patient tells you this lesion is uh, growing in the past few months or the machine cannot know this information. So it's uh, your, uh, your, your duty to uh, understand and have a global view of the lesions and the patient. So it, this is like uh, that you really, we need to use the technology wisely, that the technology can help us, but um, we still, we need our clinical skills and the, the communication with our patient. Um, I saw a publication of you, Pier Giacomo, uh, about looking at the lesions at the margins um, uh, to use uh, confocal for uh, for selecting surgical margins. Could you explain yeah. us a little bit what would, what you do in this with this technique in the surgical margins? Yeah, uh, when you uh, treat a patient uh, with, uh, a, for example, a, a squamous cell carcinoma on a head, but with a very severe photo damage, or on the other side, when you try to understand the true margins of a lenticomalenia melanoma, often it's very difficult with the simple view. But uh, with, uh, uh, for example, with confocal or with LCOCT, it's very easy because uh, you can uh, put a mark on the skin of the patient and you read if uh, this margin is uh, free of lesions or skin or skin uh, uh, tumor cell or not. That is, in some way, is a virtual MOS surgery. It's uh, because it's, uh, it has a high efficacy and so on. But on the other side, you must uh, take in your mind that uh, we have also new techniques for the real-time uh, examination of the margins of the most surgery. Ex vivo, confocal is very useful for this because you have uh, the uh, on-time image of the margins of your lesions. So we know if you have to take more skin in the in the margins or not. So these are uh, now they are expensive, but I believe that in a few years they will become much more uh, affordable for for many centers throughout uh, throughout Europe. The problem is uh, uh, we have a, a, at now with a double uh, a, a double layer of dermatologists. Sorry to tell this, but is dermatologists who can use and uh, have the possibility to use these new techniques and new drugs, for example, and dermatologists that cannot. So I believe that it's uh, probably we must uh, work in the or in the uh, regulatory uh, level 
to have all the colleagues uh, in, in, a, this, in the possibility to give all the colleagues the possibility to use these new techniques and the new drugs. I think that's a fantastic closure of your overview on uh, the long-term management of actinic keratosis, the screening for melanoma, the use of the new technologies. Uh, Pierre Giacomo, is there anything that you would like to uh, tell our uh, listeners um, that we have not touched yet that you think is important in this context? No, I believe that we have uh, uh, give uh, the idea of a new landscape of the dermatologist, uh, uh, of, of the work of a, a dermatologist in the coming years. And uh, I would like to be here in three years to tell you if my uh, idea of the future of the work will be true or not. Thank you very much. We will keep you on the list. Thank you very much. Before you go, a quick favor. If you are a regular listener to our podcast, we would love to hear from you. Your feedback will help us improve the show and develop episodes that you are interested in hearing. To participate in the short survey, simply follow the link in the show notes of this episode. Thank you for your support. It means a lot. We look forward to hearing from you. Until the next episode, take care of your skin.